Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be with you. Today, uh, we are looking at uh, the master tori- storyteller, Jesus, one of the stories that he told, uh, the story of the great, um, or the parable of, uh, of the, the father who goes to the prodigal son, uh, actually the sons. Um, but uh, I want to invite you to turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 15 as we look at this uh, great story of Jesus together. It's a beautiful story. It's also a longer story. I'm going to read the whole thing, but I, I could use your help. And so if, if, number one, if you could just kind of pay attention, but uh, I'm going to ask for some voices too. So if that's okay, everybody just say, we got this. We got, it. got it. All right. Thank you. We got this in Peru, right? Online. All right. Let me read. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my, are my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll, sell, I'll set out and go on back. Everybody say, go on back. Go on back. Say, go on back. go on back. I'll set out and go on back to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went on back to his father. But while he was still, as he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupted him. He said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Everybody say celebrate. Celebrate. Say it like you mean it. Celebrate. Celebrate. There we go. (laughs) Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the, the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brothers come home, he said. And your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Well, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. Everybody say, go in. in. Say it again, go in. in. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just ask that you would reveal the truth about who we are and about what it is that you want to do in us and through us. So speak to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a, a, a beautiful story, but a story of a father's love, but it's also it's a story of incredible separation. Uh, my mom and dad, um, they, uh, they raised me well, I think, and um, gave me lots of chores to do. And, uh, and, and so I remember just before I left for college, my mom saying, hey, uh, come with me into the laundry room. She said, I need to teach you how to do laundry. I, I had lots of other chores, but laundry wasn't one of them. And so, you know, she showed me, you know, this knob and that and how to, you know, um, clean out the, uh, the, the, the lint trap and all those kinds of things. I don't remember much of anything. I do help at, uh, at home. But one thing that I remember mom scared me to death with is this. You do not put your brights and your whites together, right? 
Don't put the bright. What happens when you put the brights and the whites together? I'm a big Indiana Hoosiers fan. I love the cream and crimson, the red and the white. I do not want pink and pink. But colors bleed when you don't separate them. Jesus wrote this or told this story because the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, if you go back to the very beginning of chapter 15, they were murmuring to themselves, how dare he eat with sinners and those traitors, the tax collectors? How could he sit, uh, sit and spend time with them? You see, the, the Pharisees, they understood that God was holy and that God calls us to be holy, to be set apart to set ourselves apart from sin. And so for the Pharisees and the tax collectors, they really like believed that we were to set ourselves apart and, and that if, if we come in contact with sin or with sinners, that something would need to bleed, something would need to die. In fact, if you, if you think about the sacrificial system in the Old Testament because of our sin, an animal would need to bleed and to die when sinners came in to the presence of a holy God. And so how in the world could this Jesus dine with sinners? Not, not only did he spend time with them, but he dined with them. He ate with sinners. And in that day, uh, a meal was a spiritual experience. Jews would not dine with people who were not Jews because there was this sense of there's this oneness that happens at the table. And so here these Pharisees, these religious leaders who really believed God is holy and he calls us to be holy, to be set apart. Here they were like just mind blown that Jesus would bridge this gap and, and would dine with sinners. And, and so Jesus responds to that mindset with a story. He says there was a certain man who had two sons. And look at, look at verse 12 with me. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided. He separated his property between them. First thing I just want us to notice here is, is the love of the father that he does not um, force his kid to stay put. The, the younger son chooses, I, I, I want to I take off. I want to get out of here. And, and the father says, okay. There's this division, this relational division that happens as the younger son asks for his share of the estate. But one thing we need to know from this story is that it was customary when the father died that he would leave to his sons his estate. What the, what the younger son is asking, hey, before you die, in fact, right now, I really wish that you were dead. I really wish that you were dead to me so that I could receive my share of the estate. Now, the oldest son would get a double portion, uh, twice as much, and, and then the younger son, so therefore he had a third coming to him. And wealth in that day uh, was not found. You couldn't just kind of, if you want to transfer money, you couldn't just kind of go online and transfer it from one account to the sons. Wealth was wrapped up in land, and it was wrapped up in livestock. So get this picture. The father, still around, decides to honor the wishes of the younger son, and so he goes down to the hardware store, he gets one of those for sale by owner signs, and he goes out and he just puts it in the yard. And as he's placing it in the yard, the neighbor across the street comes over. Hey, what you doing? Uh, it looks like you're selling the place. Where are you going? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. Well, why is the for sale? Well, my son is moving on and he wishes I was dead. And you can just see the, the humiliation, the embarrassment. Uh, in that day, in a very kind of patriarchal, fatherly society, um, it was all about honor and respect for the father. And so you can just kind of, you know, maybe even just kind of picture the embarrassment as the father has to explain to the neighbor, you know, well, and, and I'm sure the others, as they drive by, you know, they're kind of looking for a place to live, and they see that, and he's got to explain over and over and over again. And people are thinking, what kind of father doesn't just kind of, you know, shape up his son? The younger son, well, he takes the money and runs. He says, um, we're told he set off for a distant 
country. Again, there's that word, separation. And he squanders all that he has in wild living. And then a famine hits. He never kind of prepared for this, but he lost everything. And he got desperate. And so what does he do? He hires himself out to some hog farmers. And they say, here, go, go work with the pigs. And as he's feeding the pigs, he's just looking at the pig's food. And by this time, he is so without anything and so hungry that he begins to just kind of crave what the pigs are eating. Do you get this picture of incredible desperation? This one who had everything uh, in the presence of and with relationship with the Father, now he recognized he has nothing. And so the story goes, Jesus says, that when he came to his senses... When he came to his senses among the, you know, the, the pigsty, he's like, I, I need to go back home. Can you remember some of you Christians when you came to your senses and recognize for the first time, I need my father. I am so lost. <laughs> I am so in need. I so do not have things figured out. I need the help of a father. When he came to his senses, he decided, I will go back home. And look at verses 18 and 19. This was what he decided. I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, and here's the track he started playing over and over in his mind. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired men. This younger son, he understands that he is hurt his father. He's cut him deep. He's made him bleed. And to go back and just expect that things will be hunky-dory again it ain't going to happen. And so he begins to, uh, to you know, kind of say this over and over in his mind of, you know what, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you, Father. And so just make me like one of your hired men. There's a difference between the hired hands and the servants in that day. The servants would live in the house. The servants were kind of bound um, to the, the, the owners. But there were the hired hands, the hired men. Those were the ones that they lived in town. And when they would come out and hire themselves out, they would get a paycheck. They would go home each day with a, with a paycheck. And so I want you to catch what this younger son is saying in his mind that he's going to rehearse to his father. He, he's saying, I'll pay you back. What I did to you, I know. I know I, I, it costs so much to you. I hurt you. But I promise, when I come back home, I will pay you back. How many of us, we can remember when we came to our senses and recognized, I need the grace and the love and the forgiveness of a father. And we came back home and he celebrated with us. But from that day on, for whatever reason, we, we began what we started with grace Kind of the mindset becomes one of, okay, now I've got to be good enough. Now I've got to follow the rules that the Father has set out for me. He's hired me for a purpose. And so I got, I got, to, I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do that and, and I got to pay him back. That's the mindset of so many followers of Jesus. I'll, I'll make it up to you, God. But, but catch the picture of the Father, verse, verse 20 here. It says that as the son was making his way back home, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And I remember this Eastern um, first century culture, it was all about honor and respect especially to the fathers. That whole honor your, your father and mother thing, that wasn't just for little kids. That was to adults as well. Honor them, respect them. And so in this first century culture, for Jesus to tell a story about a father that runs out to embrace his son after what the son had done, that would have been unheard of. In fact, the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law would have been shaking their heads along with that neighbor that neighbor who saw the, the, the father just running out, you know, running out and down the street. You see, in that Eastern culture, 
When, when a son had done something like that, never would a father come out to meet him. The father would remain in the house, remain closed off, and it would be the responsibility, the full responsibility of that son to come. And the expectation was he would grovel. He would go to one of the servants and say, can I please come before my father and beg And then the father would be expected to make him wait, to make him wait, if at ever, to welcome him into his presence. And so for a father to go out and to meet one who had so dishonored and disrespected him, the Pharisees would have been hearing this story and shaking their heads. But then when Jesus says he ran, I mean, now the story just gets ridiculous patriarchs in that day, they didn't run. You know, I would take my kids, my boys, when they were younger, we'd go to, you know, Chuck E. Cheese's. You know, we'd just like make it in the front door and, you know, there's the plastic ball pit. This is pre-COVID, right? I mean, they would just take off uninhibited, right? I mean, this is the picture of the father running by and that neighbor across the street is going, oh my goodness. And the Pharisees who are hearing this story are going, oh my goodness. The father would have had to hike up the robe. You'd see his ankles, his legs. You don't do that in that day. And he would run undignified, run to his lost son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And, and then as the father or the son is rehearsing, the, rehearsing you know, what he was thinking, hey, I'm, I'm a sinner, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you, and I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be, and the, the father's not hearing any of that. He's embracing him, he's kissing him, and then he turns to uh, back, look back home, and he says, uh, hey, bring, he's speaking to the servants, he says, bring the robe for my son, he's, he's hungry, he's tired, he's cold, clothe him sandals, put him on his feet. You can just see he's naked and, and, and in need. And so they bring him the robe and the sandals. And then he, then he tells about putting this ring on his finger. And this ring was a sign of authority. You were not just a servant. You are not just a hired hand. All the authority of sonship belongs to you. These rings, kind of these signet rings would have been used to dip into hot wax, to sign contracts, to seal things. It was, it was only given to those with authority. And so what's being said when he puts that ring on his finger is you are no longer a servant. You are my son. You are my son. We just sang about it. I'm a child of God. And, and then he says, kill the fattened calf. Let's throw a party. And in that day, Boy, meat was such a, um, a hot commodity. They wouldn't have meat, you know, even except at like really rare occasions. Think of like how often do you throw a party and have a DJ? Like just like super special occasions, right? Like, like he's like, grab the DJ, you know, get the good one. We're having us a party. And verse 24 says, for this son of mine was dead. Vast separation, relationally Distance was so great. He was dead, but he's alive. He's come back home. He was lost, and now he's found. Can you imagine that younger son's joy? He was so enslaved by his his sin and guilt. He came back groveling, just hoping that he could, you know, work in the in the fields for his father. Hopefully, someday, earn back. And the father just like cuts the chains in two, sets him free, wraps his arms around him and says, come back home. Some of us maybe today we can identify with the younger son. The distance between you and God just feels so overwhelming. Maybe you've been kind of trying to wrap your mind around a God of love and, and your, your understanding and, and, and your mindset has been just a, a God of wrath, and yet you hear other people talk about this intimate relationship with a loving Heavenly Father. Boy, maybe it's time hearing this story of Jesus, uh, of a God who loves you, who bleeds for you who is so unwilling to let that separation keep you from coming back home. Maybe it's time for you to come back home. John 3, 16. 
We, we know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Those are Jesus' words, the very next verse. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, even though he was dishonored by our sin. But rather, he sent him into the world to save the world through him. The younger son chooses to come on back. Come on back home. And the father throws a party. For some of us maybe here today or online in Peru, boy, maybe there's just been such a distance, a separation between you and the father. Hear his voice calling to you. He's been standing on the front porch waiting for you. And now as you just choose to just come on back, He wants to throw a party, a a celebration that you whom were lost are found. The party begins, but meanwhile, meanwhile, after a full day of work in his father's fields, the older son, the older son hears the music and the dancing going on back at the house. And as he's making his way back from a long day of, you know, of work in his father's fields, he, he asks one of the servants, Hey, what's going on up at the house? That DJ really sounds good. And the servant explains to him, your brother, whom was lost, has been found, and he's come back home. And so dad, he he killed the calf, and he's getting ready to throw a party, and you would think the older son would just be delighted, but no. He's angry, and he refuses to go back inside. He didn't want any part of this conversation about my brother. He didn't want to think about his family. He was thinking about himself. And he was stewing. And he refused to go back inside. So you can just imagine him standing out in the shadows, quite a distance from the house, separated from the party going on. And what does the father do? He does the exact same thing with the older son that he did with the younger one. He recognizes he's not here to celebrate with us. And so he makes his way away from the party and comes outside to where the son is. Jesus had just been telling a story to these Pharisees before this one about a shepherd who had 99 sheep, but one of them one of the 100 kind of went off and and so what does the father do? He leaves the 99 he leaves the party, and he goes, goes after seeking out the lost sheep. Here's that picture of the father leaving the 99 and coming out to where the older son is. And listen to the older son's words as he stands there tapping his toe, angry. He says, look, he doesn't even call him father. Look, all these years, I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, not once, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. L- listen to the language. He doesn't call him father. He, he kind of refers to him as master. I- I've been your servant. I've been slaving for you. I- I've never disobeyed your orders. This older son, he's forgotten what a loving, graciously, gracious father that he has. He's forgotten that he is a son, and he's forgotten that he has a brother who is a son as well. You hear how twisted his thinking is? Maybe he's a lot more like his younger brother than we might first anticipate. You see, that younger brother, the track in his head going back home was, I don't deserve it, but I'll earn it. And the track in the older brother's mindset was, I've earned it. I've been here. I've been in your house. I've served in your field. I've done it all. The whole list that you've asked of me, I didn't do this and I did this. Hey, are you a, a follower of Jesus? Yeah, I go to church. Hey, are you a Christian? Oh, I, I serve on the, one of the ministry teams. Hey, are you a worshiper of God? Do you love God? Oh, oh yeah, I give money to the Feed His Children ministry. We get our mind, um, the soundtrack in our mind becomes, I got to earn the favor of my father. 
And that's what this story is all about. It's, it's really not about a prodigal son. It's about a gracious, loving, heavenly father who in spite of our sin, in spite of the distance that we have created for him, he is the one that bridges the gap. He is the one that is unwilling to allow that separation to continue. And so he comes out and he meets us right where we're at and says, come back home. You are my son or my daughter. But look at this older son. He didn't even want to think about his younger brother. He didn't want to think about him. Friends, I want you to hear this. When we lose sight that we're the younger brother, we immediately become the older one. Followers of Jesus, the minute we forget that the amazing grace that God offered to us in that moment that we said yes to coming back home, when we forget that that amazing grace is still offered to us day by day and moment by moment, whether you've been a follower of Jesus for 10 days or, or 25 years, it is by grace that we are saved. And the minute that we flip on this switch and we start thinking it's all up to us to earn it, to be better, to be more righteous and more holy apart from his presence, boy, we lose sight. And the older brother, he didn't even want to think about the younger son, the younger brother. And how many of us, boy, we just get so busy doing life that we forget about those that are out in the pigsty and they haven't come to their senses yet. And the Lord has called us to walk with him, to go with him, get out, out, of, out of the house and go love on the younger brothers. When we lose sight that we're the younger son, boy, we become just like the older one. And, and we become enslaved, those, chain, those chains we've been singing about. Maybe not chains of sin and shame and guilt, but chains of apathy. Chains of, of forgetfulness that, that where the Holy Spirit of God wants to take us is to those that are lost and broken. And he says, come with me. All that I have, it belongs to you. And, and then, then he asks this question. He says to the older son, don't you know that I'm with you always? And don't you know that all that I have, it belongs to you? Friends, can I ask you a question? And that's this. Is not God's presence enough? Is not his intimate presence and nearness to us enough that every day when we might wake up, we might say, thank God for his grace and mercy. I love him. God, go with me, equip me, provide for me. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was willing to bleed. He was willing to bleed. He was unwilling to allow that separation from God to continue. Friends, could you just hear me? It's time to come on back. And for some of us, it's time to come on back in. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song about the amazing grace of God. And that my chains, my chains fell off because of the love of the Father. And there may be some of you here today that you're hearing a, maybe a, a, in a fresh new way about the loving grace of God. Not only for, uh, for his provision for you, but his very presence for you. And maybe today would be the day that you would come on back home. There may be many of us older brothers who we've lost sight of the very presence and power of God that goes with us everywhere that we are, but he's calling us to hop off the front porch and to watch out for the younger uh, brother who's, who's part of the family of God. There are brothers and sisters. Let's love on them. 
We're going to sing this song, Amazing Grace. My chains have been set free. I want to ask you, um, I want to give you some space to respond to God today. Maybe for those of you online, it's just bowing your heads and praying with me a prayer of coming back home or coming back in. For those of you in Peru and, and gathered here, you know, coming Coming to our senses and coming back home or coming back in, it, it requires we kind of, we move. We take a, 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 a stance. And so I'm going to invite you in just a moment, if you'd like, to just come and kneel at one of these altars here. And, and maybe you might just pray, Jesus, I, I'm, I, want, I need to come back home. I'm not worthy, but you make me worthy. Shape me, transform me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Thank you for more, so much more than a story. But thank you for Jesus, who is willing to bridge the gap of separation because of our sin. We are so unworthy. But God, because of Jesus and his willingness to embrace the cross, because of his suffering and death, God, we can find eternal life in you. We believe in you, Jesus. Draw near to us, we pray. Amen.